And hello, Blogging Heads Nation. That's normally what Heather says when we start. Uh, I'm Daniel Dresner. I'm a professor of international politics at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and I blog at Foreign Policy Magazine. And I'm Heather Herbert, Executive Director of the National Security Network. And we are here today to talk about a number of things, but let's start off with the juicy, dishy stuff that everyone inside the Beltway cares about, which is who the next Secretary of State is going to be, potentially, um, and whether it's going to be Susan Rice. So the first thing to say, and this is this is the fun part because it's where we set ourselves up to look really stupid by the time this goes online, but um, <laughs> the latest conventional wisdom here inside the Beltway is that actually nobody wants to upset the fiscal cliff negotiations so that, in fact, we won't have any cabinet appointments for another couple of weeks, sort of regardless of the wins. Right, which that, you know, I have to say that actually makes some degree of sense, although, you know, I, I, I yearn for the days when when administrations could walk and chew gum at the same time. I know that was a long time ago, but I'm pretty sure... When was that? Tell, tell me when that was. I, you, know, I would, you know, the Clinton administration seemed capable of doing that every once in a while. The George H.W. Bush administration. You know, I, Cold War so, administrations could do that. So I just, I just have to say that uh, the Clinton okay. administration at the time was notorious for its supposed incompetence and ability to walk and chew gum at the same time, and the, the rap on us... Really, until yeah. until the last year or two, was that we were constantly thrown off by something or another. Heather, we just didn't know how good we had it until you know successive <laughs> later administrations. So you know, well, that I think just you're makes me wonder. It just <laughs> makes me wonder. You know how? I mean, number one, it's like I don't know about you as a parent, but I now hear myself saying things about my kids that I definitely remember my parents saying about me. Um, <laughs> oh, oh, or about yes. you know my generation, how badly math is taught, for example, and how kids yeah. today have no attention span, blah, blah, blah. So I wonder if there's some of that with administration. And I also wonder whether yeah. the sort of proliferation of, of information has actually sort of made it, you know, there's more gum to chew, as it were. That's possible. Or it, the better way to phrase it might be is that it's costlier to chew gum now than it used to be. Uh, because people actually see you chewing the gum, and, you know, they're like, oh, if you're chewing gum, that's such a nasty habit. Whereas before, you know, as you say, if this was even 20 years ago, uh, presumably the Obama administration could do a, a somewhat more behind-the-scenes approach to gauge or test whether or not particular candidates would be okay for the various foreign, you know, uh, foreign affairs jobs. Um, and you apparently can't do that now. Well, to, to sort of analogize this to the to the Benghazi situation, I did a I did a Huffington Post live thing with um, Ambassador Prudence Bushnell, who was our ambassador in Nairobi uh, when that embassy was bombed and the, the embassy in Tanzania was bombed, and, and a lot right. of lives were lost, American and locals. And you know, her ability to to repost in public on that was limited to one at one op-ed in the New York Times. And you know there was no yeah. there was no agonizing live tweeting from the building, and you you know and, and frankly much less fuss was made over that incident, which was a much bigger breach of security, and many many more lives were lost, including many more Americans. Were lost. Yeah, and that has it has something to do with politics and something to do with information. No, I think you're right. I mean, yeah, one of the one of the the and this came up during the Benghazi attack, which you know, which was again horrible and and. Uh, uh, not the Obama administration's finest moment, let's say, but, you know, it gave this perception of, oh, America's under siege, where, you know, anyone who had actually looked at, like, the data, you know, showed that the average number of embassy, you know, inc and consulate incursions in the 70s was something on the order of, like, 20 or 30, you know, a year. Or, I mean, it, it was a much larger number than what's actually happened over the last 10 years. So part of this, you're right, is also sort of uh, uh, presentism, I guess, for lack of a better way of putting it. You know, the belief that whatever we're experiencing now is completely new and, and never we've have we seen this before. Steve Martin had a line about Wuja Day. The absolute <laughs> okay. certainty that nothing like this has ever happened before. <laughs> right, so with the, the allowance of that inside the Beltway uh, uh, knowledge about why they're going to push off until January, and of course now with the added uh, frisson that apparently John McCain will be on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, which... Uh, will make any kind of confirmation hearings interesting. I'm going to ask you as a, because I'm, I'm outside the Beltway, I'm inside the academic Beltway, which is a totally different and even weirder uh, thing. I'm going to ask you pointedly, I'm not sure I understand the Obama administration's thinking of how they're playing the Susan Rice thing, because, you know, so you had this sort of 
trial balloon thing where she met with various Republican senators, but she wasn't given the imprimatur of actually being a confirmee you know, uh, or, you know, the, uh, someone that the Obama administration wanted to appoint. And, you know, she did the rounds, and I think it would be safe to say that the rounds did not go terribly well. Now, why it didn't go terribly well is a whole separate issue. But I'm not entirely sure why anyone thought this was a terribly good idea. Well, two things. I mean, there is okay. sort of a central rule of politics now that you don't let something bleed. You immediately step in and try to fix it. And I think it's also safe to say that one thing that, that we know about John McCain is if you ignore him, he will not go away. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, purely from the point of view of Ambassador Rice being able to do the job she has now and mm -hmm. the administration being able to, to conduct a foreign policy, I, you can see why um, there was a dis... And also, frankly, um, McCain and, and Graham are, are two of the more friendly senators on, on a number of issues. And in fact, there's many ways yeah. of having McCain on that foreign relations is going to be good for the administration. So, mm -hmm. so there was every reason, um, totally apart from whether or not she's going to be nominated for Secretary of State, for her to go in right away and try to uh, try to mend fences. Now, I think you raise a good question of whether whether the Republicans had any interest in seeing those fences mended, or, or whether it was more useful to them for various political and personal reasons to keep keep this going the way it is. And it's, I mean, it's not clear. I mean, the, the, I think the. But the other thing is, to be fair, I don't know, you know, this this goes into deeper questions. I don't know Susan Rice. I'm, I'm sure you do. Um, but I am struck by the way in which I hear a lot of back chatter, and it's not just from Republicans, you know, about people dubious or not necessarily thrilled with the prospect of Susan Rice being Secretary of State. Now, I know part of this has to do with sort of intra-democratic tribal loyalties, Namely, that Susan went to, you know, that, that Susan Rice went to the Obama campaign uh, when a lot of the foreign policy people were going for Clinton. But still, it, to an outside observer, it's it's rather startling to see, in some ways, how little armor she's getting from the administration in trying to make her case. So this is something else that's actually changed really dramatically. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. the last time we faced this, there was this epic battle among. Um, George Mitchell, Richard Holbrook, and Madeleine Albright in um, about this time in 1996. And, Ooh, good times. Yeah, and, go ahead. and there was, I mean, epic levels of hostility. And, you know, among people who had worked together, you know, who had known each other, who had fought in the trenches, in some pretty miserable trenches, you know, frankly, in the, the really dark days for Democrats and national security. And there right. were a lot of hurt feelings that persisted um, for decades about that. But it didn't all play out on Twitter. And yeah, you know, somebody true. like me, who's in the position of having worked for, with basically every name that has been mentioned for Secretary of State except Chuck Hagel, is someone I've worked for. Yes. So, you know, in 1996, nobody was, you know, putting my face in front of a video camera and saying, Heather, talk about all these people that you've worked for that perhaps you would, say, would like to work for again someday. So, Heather, if you, want to, if you want to blink in code as a way of communicating, <laughs> you can. You know. No, so I think... I mean, so first of all, I'm not going to get too juicy, and if you want to turn off the swagging heads now, you know, that's why. But my way of figuring out how to have some integrity and yet continue to be interesting to talk to is that, you know, a lot of this, so I guess one other thing to back up and say is that the, yes. the split in 2008 was a right. generational one. And yeah. A lot of the Democratic foreign policy establishment stayed with, with Senator Clinton, who was the establishment candidate. A lot of younger people, um, both wanting a new face and, frankly, thinking it was an opportunity to jump the generational queue, went to Obama. And I, honestly, most people, not everybody, but most people I know are kind of over that at this point. Um, okay. I do think that if you take, so, so Carrie, Carrie Rice, Donilon, Hagel... Bill Burns, the current number two at state. Um, oh. They all have, you know, sort of different. Who have I? Is there anyone I've left out? You got any dark, Nick, dark horses? Nick, Nick Burns. Burns sorry, as, as a sock, yeah. as a sock to Boston, we add Nick Burns. <laughs> um, and they all, you know, they're all really interestingly different. What do you think is most important in a second term Secretary of State? Is it that the person should have the president's ear and speak for the president, right. or do you have to have Susan? No other choice. 
Um, yeah. Is it that the person is has global stature in his or her own right? Then you have to have either Carrie or Susan. Is it that the person has sort of a national following and a national conciliating mode? Then you have either Carrie or Hegel. Is it that it's someone who's really, really a fabulous negotiator? Then mm. it's possibly Susan, possibly Bill Burns. Um, is, it, mm. is it somebody who knows how to speak on the world stage? That it's Susan Carey or Nick Burns. And, you know, those are all, and we really were in this confused moment about, and um, who wrote this? Somebody, somebody wrote a kind of nasty piece about this recently that I didn't want to agree with, but I did. Of, you know, what is, <laughs> what is our, what do we have a Secretary of State for? At this point, and you know, as fun as it is to Do, bitch and backbite, and another? you know, yeah, 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 as fun as it is to bitch and backbite, and you know, the interesting thing is that um, all of these people have long Washington careers, and, and all of them are people that you could get people to bitch and backbite about off the record. But you know, which set of strengths do you actually want? Yeah, I mean, and it, I will say that at least the tentative, you know steps for uh, someone outside the Beltway. What's intriguing is that it looks like uh, Obama is actually replicating what you saw George W. Bush do in his second term, which was in his second term you saw a lot of people that originally were in his White House then taking jobs outside the White House in the cabinet agencies. Condi Rice moving to, you know, to state being uh, just one example of that. Um, and you're seeing, you know, it, or being promoted from within. So, you know, in the case of uh, now, you know, is uh, Susan Rice, who is not admittedly in the White House, but is clearly a, a you know Obama loyalist, I think it would be safe to say, potentially going to state. And you know, I've heard uh, rumblings about Dennis McDonough becoming chief of staff. Uh, you can tell me how much weight to place on that one. Um, you know, but you're right. I mean, the answer is, is that there are different modes that you can pick in terms of, of what you want um, in a Secretary of State. It does strike me, though, that given that. As much praise as there has been for Hillary Clinton as a Secretary of State, and I think you, you know you can there's bipartisan consensus she's done a pretty good job. What is striking to me is the extent to which foreign policy, big foreign policy decisions in this administration are being done from the White House, um, and so in, that would tend one to assume that Susan Rice would actually be the best choice, not for Susan Rice's intrinsic abilities. I really don't have any comment on that. I don't know her, and I'm, you know, again, I'm sort of, as an outsider, fascinated by watching this play out. Um, but the one thing I would say that presumably of all the candidates that have been, you know, of all the options, maybe with the exception of Donald, um, Susan Rice clearly has Barack Obama's ear. Um, and so, you know, in, in ways that Condi Rice was a better Secretary of State than Colin Powell because foreign interlocutors knew when they were talking to Connie, they were talking to George W. Bush. I assume Susan Rice would have that as advantage. Yeah. No, and I think that, just from a bureaucratic point of view, that is a hugely important consideration. I will just say, as a, as a sort of theoretical point, I'm mm -hmm. really concerned about a world in which more and more a president is his own Secretary of State. Um, yeah. At the same time as, as you noted at the beginning, we're sort of losing the ability to walk and chew gum at the same time. But that's yet more yeah. gum you have to chew. And I, you know, the only way I see it being manageable um, in as the world gets more and more complex and as there's more and more important stuff outside of our borders that we have to do all the time, not just in crisis situations, is that, in fact, um, cabinet departments are going to have to get more empowered rather than less. Yet that is the exact opposite of the way the trend is. I don't think it's it's not even cabinet departments. It's cabinet. It's policy principles um, beyond the the president. It's the notion that you will be able to, to task your secretary of state to be able to negotiate on your behalf on particular issues. Whereas I think, unfortunately, the tendency in the past fifteen years, I would say actually starting with Madeleine Albright, you could potentially argue, is where the president was running foreign policy, except for a few issues that were either politically distasteful or clearly the pet projects of the secretary of state. And that was where they had the lead, but not a lot else. And that's, you know, in some ways, just... It didn't... You want to back on that? It didn't feel that way, you know, since I was... I spent three years in the, the Albright State. Yeah, yeah. It didn't... No, and I'm... I'm it, it certainly didn't feel that way at the time. Um, and it didn't feel... You know, I also worked for Christopher, so it, it didn't feel like we had less heft um, in the second term than we did in the first. Um I mean, Clinton was more involved and more confident in the second term. Right. That's certainly right. true, but um, there, I, 
No, I yeah, I do think, although it's, I, I want to push back, but I'm also recognizing that I'm a biased, uh, I'm a biased <laughs> observer. Um, what makes yeah. you say that it started with Albright? Let me let me ask the question that way. That's a fair question. I mean, I think it started and with then, her. And then you've opened honest, the door for me to started... get into the gender piece. That's which is perfectly fine. Um, I think it started with her for a couple of reasons. The first is is that you could argue that in the second term of the Clinton administration, in some ways, the principal foreign policy agency wasn't the State Department; it was the Treasury Department, um, because the the issue, the biggest issue that consumed the second term of the Clinton administration in terms of foreign policy was the Asian financial crisis. And let's face it, Albright did not have much skin in that game, um, and did not have much input. And it was basically a Bob Rubin, Larry Summers. Uh, you know, out to a lesser extent, Alan Greenspan show. Um, and I think that was also the issue that engaged uh, that engaged Clinton uh, more. And then once you've got, the, you know, after that, in some ways, I don't think it, I think there are different reasons for each successive administration. In the case of, of Bush 43, it was because he didn't trust Colin Powell after a year or two, and it was clear that, you know, Rumsfeld and Cheney were running the show there. Um, you can argue that once Condi became Secretary of State, there was a reversal, of course, that, that she really did uh, have more of an input. Um, and with Hillary, with Secretary of State Clinton, it's a tougher... I'm not sure how to... She's on the one hand been a magnificent Secretary of State, but on the other hand, you know, as, as you were, you know, agreed with me before, a lot of sort of the big policy decisions, if let's face it, have been coming from the White House. I think she's had significant input at pivotal moments, but I'm not sure... She hasn't had the lead on a lot of things, I guess would be the way to put it. So, not to get bogged down in the 90s, but um, and not to dispute the importance of the Asian financial crisis, but we did run a war during the second term. Yes, yes, yes. There was the, there was Kosovo. Um, I agree. You know, we that. ran a war, and also um, the... And that was, and Albright did play, I, I, but in some ways that was it. What Albright was doing was the Balkans, which you can argue was significant. But, uh, but I, you know, again, and this might be where... You know, our own biographies have, you know, lead to biases. I would care more about the Asian financial crisis. So, but when um, you're the president so of the United just, States yeah. and you have troops that you're sending into harm's way somewhere, sort of, it almost, and I mean, and this is, you know, this is a dilemma that we still face today that it might be that in terms mm -hmm. of U.S. overall interest in health, the Asian financial crisis was more important. But when you're putting right. troops in harm's way, you're not allowed to consider anything more important than that. So that, you know, that gets us back to our walk and chew gum problem. Yes, this is true, um, and you're right. You know, the, the you know use of force always carries the headlines, which I'm not sure. You know, it, I have mixed feelings about. It. On the one hand, it should that's you know you're sending sending U.S. Uh, forces in harm's way is relatively significant. On the other hand, these are not you know Asian financial crisis, global financial crisis, not picky issues. You know, I, I, in, and in some ways far more important to the, your average American. No, so it, it, that's an interesting way of reformulating the use of force test. That you should only perhaps or frame this as a question. Should it be the case yep. that you only commit U.S. troops to enterprises that it's okay if they're more important than anything else your government is trying to do at that moment? That's an interesting way of thinking about it. And that, again, is one of the ways in which you, you sort of look back at the Libya operation. And from a truly rational cost-benefit analysis, you can say that was a policy that worked, that, you know, it was very little amounts of U.S. investment there was a successful regime change. There is a, you know, a regime in Libya that, for all its fragility, is pretty pro-American. Um, you know, that counts as a success. And yet, on the other hand, you had a situation where this was a, a case that made lots of headlines, sucked up a lot of oxygen in Washington, even though both Obama and, you know, Obama and all the policy principles admitted this was hardly a core national interest. Um, and in some ways, I, you know, this goes back to your original point about the way Washington works now in terms of the, the, the information system as opposed to how it worked in the past. Although then there's another interesting corollary that comes from that. If we continue to make the choice, as I think we will, to maintain the world's largest, strongest military, be the world's <laughs> matchless military power, we're going to keep being asked or it keeps seeming like there's no alternative but to get into these situations and then you are sort of conceding that you may not have the bandwidth to play the economic leadership role that, that you're sort of aspiring to. And so it's, it's an interesting, yeah. interesting self-weakening process. Right. And actually, to be, to, I think to, to Hillary Clinton's credit, this is actually something she's really tried hard you know, it, this in this term to work on, you know, the, her sort of economic statecraft initiative, um, I think is an instance where she recognizes, look, 
our foreign policy is perhaps just a wee bit too militarized, and, and maybe we need to start thinking about other uh, other tools of influence. And in fact, I've got, I'm working on a long paper about this, uh, about whether or not uh, military preeminence actually brings the economic benefits that uh, a lot of uh, D.C. defense wants like to claim. But yes, I agree with you. That's a, It's a concern. Do, and in your paper, make sure you look up the UMass study that looked at the comparative values of government spending and found that basically defense spending is the least job-creating form of government spending there is. Pretty much anything else, oh, anything yeah, yeah, else yeah. government spends on creates more jobs because of the mm-hmm. nature of the nature of the defense industry, which is which is really interesting. But I um I threatened to pull the gender card a minute ago, so now I will now I will pull the gender card. Okay, hold on. I just need to get my white flag. Just go ahead. <laughs> yeah. All right. So there is there is no upside in this next card of the conversation for me. I'm just going to stipulate that. But I do I am actually looking forward to it. Go ahead. Well, there's not a lot. There's actually not a lot of upside for me in it either. Um, that's it. That's fair. No, that's ac- that's actually a fair I'm point. Sure. I, I, I'm I not can sure. I mean, and that's an interesting. Yeah. I mean, that's an interesting point all by itself. That there's this discussion that we sort of have to have, and yet you know nobody comes out of it. Nobody comes out of it enriched. So there is there's sort of the narrow question, which is first of all, would um, would Susan Rice have been the chosen target of ire over Benghazi? And would people eagerly be going around behind her back saying, oh, Susan is brusque and has sharp elbows, if she yeah. were a man? And then the larger question related to that, which Anne-Marie Slaughter raised in the Post on Sunday, and I have to actually praise Anne-Marie here for doing the thing that most female professionals deeply fear doing and having now published two articles in a row, which actually make reference to the fact that she is a female. Um, <laughs> Um, but but Anne-Marie, yes. you know, says, so should we have a male Secretary of State? Do Is the way that women are raised to think uniquely qualifying for Secretary of State? And how should we think about that? And um, Dan is yeah. crawling under his desk now. Yeah, no, no, no. no well, let me, let me put, well, first of all, I'm extremely leery of this because one of the... Uh, one of the things I've discovered over the last month or so, I, have you heard the term mansplaining? Yes, yeah, so, you know, you asked me to do this now, I feel like I'm, you know, any any long peroration I give is going to be, a, a, you know, mansplaining. Um, I, you know, I, I think in some ways, though, isn't the, the fact that Susan Rice would be the, what, fourth, you know, female Secretary of State in the last 15 years suggest that, I mean, this is one of those things where I'm going to defend the Republicans. I don't think this is a necessarily about her gender. You know, you, you can say a lot of things about Madeleine Albright, Condi Rice, Hillary Clinton. They're three very different women. Um, and yet, you know, nothing like this sort of stuff was talked about, really, if, if memory serves, you know, during their confirmation processes. Um, so, you know, part of this might be whether Susan Rice plays the political game as well as those three women. But I don't think this is necessarily unique to her gender. Um, or be, because of her status as a woman. Um, with regard to Anne Marie's piece, I, you know, yeah. On the one hand, I'm glad this stuff is being talked about. On the other hand, I'm not going to lie. There were parts of that essay that just made me cringe because it's it's such an essentialist argument of oh, we're women, so we're raised to be in this sort of nurturing, you know, envi-. In some ways, it contradicts the, the the narrative about Susan Rice, which is. You know, the problem with Susan Rice is essentially she has sharp elbows and, and you know, uh, is plainly spoken. And, you know, God, you can't have that in the State Department because, you know, someone like Richard Holbrook was all cuddly and uh, and nice. But um, but in, in some ways that that is against the stereotype that, you know, or, that, or the, the ostensibly gendered uh, qualities that Anne-Marie is talking about in that Washington Post piece. Yeah, as someone who was told at the beginning of my career that I didn't want to work in arms control because women didn't like arms control, I uh, have always been intensely, Ugh. intensely uncomfortable with essentialist arguments. As someone who, um, you know, as I just was earlier, likes to interrupt people and win arguments, um, you know, I never, <laughs> I, I used to read that stuff in college and think, wait, what are they talking about? Um, but right. at having now you know, been in the workplace 20 years, um, there are different um, curves. How I think about it, you know, there's not diff- the curves overlap, yeah. but there are different curves. And, um, you know, I wish that, I guess I'd say, I wish it were possible to make the point 
that to make the the academic point um, that Anne-Marie is making about the role of networking and horizontal interactions um, and interdependence mm-hmm. without reference to chromosomes and you know, roughly tights and upbringing and all that kind of thing. But I fear that the essentialist argument is the way that people grab onto the larger argument about different ways of, of, of being in the yeah. world. And I've kind of, I find, as I get older, started a little bit to make to make my peace with the essentialist argument and just decide that I could go out and, and interrupt people and have sharp elbows and you know, be, be renowned for my bad temper on conference calls and at the same time say, yeah, you know, it's not the same as, you know, but I'm sure you, Dan, never have bad temper on conference. <laughs> no, but let me say this. I actually, this is actually one of the areas where I do think the gender thing makes a huge difference, which is, for lack of a better way of putting it, displaying temper or anger. Um, and this is where I really do. Th- I, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly, and I agree with I think would say Anne Maria wholeheartedly. Is simply put, you know, in my experience, you know, whenever I'm in policy making circles, but I'm at the academy, men can display anger, and it's tougher for women to do so. Um, or it doesn't, you know, it, 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 it has far more negative ramifications when women do it. And that, that I actually think is appalling. I don't disagree with that. Um, uh, and so, I, you know, maybe that is because of the sort of essentialist argument. Although I am curious whether is part of the reason you've made your peace with the essentialist argument is because you're now a parent. Um, hmm, that is a great question. I actually, um, I had made one piece with it before... Before yeah. having children, just having worked in the work, I mean, I think it was the, the point where I was in a job I really loved, and I found out I was getting paid ten thousand dollars a year less than my male counterparts, doing exactly the same thing. And I went right. in to yeah. complain, and they said to me, "Oh, you never asked." And I said, "Aha! There are a couple of different things going on." Here. So, so that was kind yeah. of my mm-hmm. moment, just for me as a professional. And then, um, uh, somewhat understood, mm-hmm. I'm the mother of a boy. So there's a whole right. other set of peace that you have to come to as a parent about both yeah. sort of, you know, my son is a football nut, actually. So I have to make a new every day <laughs> my peace with <laughs> yes. I'm working. Okay. Actually, I tell you what, I've made my peace with gender essentialism. I have not yet made my peace with the Washington Redskins. How about that? Oh, and that you know, and, and now they're suddenly very popular inside the. Uh, after ten years, Dan Snyder's finally managed to put together to do a good team. Right. It yeah. only took a yeah. bit. Yeah, and I, we have to hiring yeah. a black quarterback, um, by the way. Smartest, smartest thing the guy ever did. Um, but no, I, I mean, as 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 the parent of, of uh, both a son and a daughter, I mean, I will say there is a small glimmer of truth, I think, in some ways, to the essential story, or at least, you know, it is only, I, I have this theory that social scientists or anyone like trained in, in the social sciences truly, you know, believes that the power of sort of, you know, policy autonomy or the ability of the environment to shape individual behavior. And it is only once you have children that you realize the truly, truly fearsome power of genetics. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and you realize, no, in fact, this cake is baked in a very particular way. And, you know, maybe there are a few things you could do on the margins. But, no, you know, you can't mix with the ingredients all that much once, the, you know, once the cake is out. So that actually seems like a good place to switch to another set of interesting um, environment versus inheritance questions. And that is the writing you've been yes, doing about the power of um, different uh, institutional PhDs in the academy. Right. So this is a uh, this is sort of an ongoing uh, public service of <laughs> doing a foreign policy blog uh, on basically you know because as a professor at Fletcher and I get a fair amount of these email inquiries you know the sort of people who basically say I want to get involved in the foreign policy community loosely you know uh, formatted and what they want to know is what is the best degree or best you know track for them and. You know, my experience that for the, the time I spent in D.C. was I was genuinely appalled at the number of people I met who, you know, Georgetown B.A., SICE M.A., and a lot of them were thinking, you know what I need to do to really get that next step up is go get a Ph.D. Um, and as someone who got a Ph.D. Uh, and, and knows what that takes, I've always warned these people, you don't grind that out. That's not how this works. Um, 
And so uh, a week or two ago, I, I engaged with Joshua Faust on this because Faust really thinks this, and I'd be curious to your take about this, that there's really been sort of degree inflation now within Washington that, you know, in fact, you know, particularly the last 10 years, getting a PhD really is one way to, to, to move up. And then there's a, a separate related issue, which assumes that it's not just any old PhD that matters. It's whether you're getting a PhD from a so-called elite institution or not. Um, and uh, there was an article in the Georgetown Public Policy Review, which would be part of a larger study, uh, that claims that what's driving, you know, a lot of hiring practices in the academy is not necessarily the superior education one gets at, let's say, a Stanford or a Harvard or a University of Chicago or a Princeton, but rather the eliteness of that, the network uh, benefits that you get from going to a Harvard or a Stanford or a University of Chicago. Uh, and here again, I confess that I have some like, mixed motivations as someone who went to those institutions. You know, no one likes being told you got to where you were solely because of structural factors and, and not in your own ability. Um, but that said, I'm certainly willing to entertain the possibility that, that that's what's going on. It's just that at least in this study that I looked at, I didn't see any evidence that they parsed out the, the merit-based versus the, the honor-based arguments. So, yeah, I, I read your stuff with interest as someone who... who um sort of got my master's, who thought I was going to end up going the PhD route and then ended up getting my master's at night, who who went to a <laughs> very prestigious undergrad institution, Brown, and a fairly but not in the same tier prestigious master's institution being the GW's Elliott School, um, although they let me go at night and they paid my way, so I'm enormously grateful to them. Um, and I would add they have a they fabulous do, they department do. now, actually. They're, I they're really got in place. at the beginning, yeah. actually, and was they were they were trying to hire more. They were, hire, they were trying to bring in more mid-career students and uh, lift up the level of the students to match huh. their faculty. And so I, I benefited from that. And it was a, and it's, and that by itself is a great example of why factors other than prestige, i.e. can come out without debt, should sway, should sway what's thinking. But yeah. as I am now in the, in the position of hiring and looking at resumes, so first of all, I wanna I wanna reassure you that merit does matter, because I could I could fill my nine person office only with people who have degrees only from first tier elite institutions, and I could fill it several times yeah. over with those people. So I have to look at things like how well do they interview, how how articulate are they, how well do they write, what are they interested in, are they willing to do whatever work needs to be done, even if it's not glamorous. Um, so, so mm -hmm. merit matters. Just, just having a fancy degree, it doesn't get you anywhere. So, so don't worry, right. Dan. We all know that you got where you are based on your your merit. It's okay. <laughs> um, Thank you. Okay. Now, Thank you, having said better. that, <laughs> having said that, I also see that some institutions have networks, and other institutions don't. Um, and yeah. some institutions have strong networks, others have weak networks. Um, so it does, it does make a big difference in what doors you get in and what jobs you hear about. And yeah, that's well, a better way of thinking about it. Yeah. If you went to mm -hmm. um, um, Mars State University, let's just say, if you went to Mars State University, I'm going to say, huh. And then, if I have time, I'll look at your resume and say, oh, this person's really amazing. If you went to the Kennedy School, you have the benefit of the doubt on being amazing. And that's sheer laziness right. on my part, but it's reality. And so, for example, we lost a staffer here who um, was went to a, a state university, Not nobody would say it was top tier really, really yeah. excellent young man, had really grown in the job, and he was hired to one of our peer institutions over 700 applicants. Now, wow. you know, and he had a leg up on anybody who, he doesn't have a master's, so this is my advertisement, which is forget the PhD, don't even get a master's until you know what you want. Um, but he had work uh -huh. experience at Clips. Now, Somebody comes ah, straight out, you know, suppose you had a master's or even a master's and a PhD and you've never written anything, you've never published, you know, yeah. you're never going to get to the top of a pile of 700 applicants and, you know, maybe you're, you're going to be more likely to get to the top 100 of the pile if your resume says Harvard, Stanford, than if it says, you know, Mars right. State. So this is, it's a real problem. 
It, it, I mean, it is. In so, I mean, as you say, part of the, the issue is is that the degree acts as a signal, and you know, you you are hardly unique. I mean, there's actually I think been studies that have suggested that yeah, having that credential gives you you know a uh, uh, a certain leg up, assuming all else is equal. The issue, though, as you point out, and this is what I keep trying to to tell people, is that first of all, if you want to if you want to get a good degree, that's great, um, but you have to consider what the opportunity costs are, both in terms of debt as you talk about, but also in terms of lost experience if you manage to be in, you know, if you're in Washington or, you know, have a, a pretty good job. And then the second thing, um, and I can't stress this enough, is the absolute worst outcome for 95% of the people is not, do I go get a PhD and then try to get a, you know, good job in D.C., or do I stay in D.C. and, you know, through experience work my way up? There's the third option which is decide to go get a Ph.D. and then not finish. Um, and that is actually the modal outcome. Uh, no, I, I, I'm not kidding. There's, there's data on this. You know, I, I, I had this in a post. You know, I think political science uh, Ph.D.s after 10 years, I, I want to say 10 years, no, 7 years, only 44% of those entering had actually had a you know, Ph.D. by that point. Um, I think when you get to 10 years, maybe it's like 51 or something. Um, but imagine for a second that you spend 7 to 10 years and then you don't get a PhD. You will be the most bitter person in the world. And you will be massively in debt and you will have no practical skills for which I, yeah. for example, can, can hire you because a PhD is not a professional yeah. degree. And you know, the, yes. the reality is there are some jobs in Washington for which a PhD fits you well, but there are an awful lot more jobs than Absolutely. it does. Yeah. Uh, and that was all I was trying to say. It was not to deny that, that there are times where having a PhD can give you a leg up. But in some ways, this is also, part, you know, the the, 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 the the origins of this, and this goes back to the uh, gender question was this the the Paula Broadwell business with David Treas where she was clearly trying to get a PhD and it, it didn't quite work out uh, at the Kennedy School and why that was um, and you know again at Fletcher I've seen students like this where they've succeeded at everything they've done to date um, they would probably excel if they stayed in Washington they, they're convinced that the PhD will give them that next you know billet upward and this is particularly true in the military um, and some people do really well, but some people founder badly because they, they only look at it as a typical Well, we've push. just been um, having a big discussion here about uh, the role <laughs> that millennials played in the election and what that says about American foreign policy and sources of legitimacy and sources of constituencies for, for American foreign policies. And one of the raps on millennials that you see all the time in the literature is that um, their parents, and since you and I, our children are... are uh, there's a, there's a word for our children, but they're not millennials. Um, yeah, we, we, this Thank is God, our okay. fault. Um, but the That's good, okay. That we, we did too good a job of making them into little conformists who have the idea that there's, as you said, a next billet you can study. And, you know, one thing about, I mean, and frankly, right. I mean, one of the reasons I thought I was going to go into the academy was that it seemed sort of structured and ordered and you could figure out what you would do next as opposed to Washington where, who the heck knows? Yeah. I mean, you know, look, I... People at my career point, you still have a hard time figuring out what's the smart thing you should you should do next, but it's very unsettling. Right. So I think there's a lure that academia has from the outside, although I understand from my family members in the profession it doesn't have this lure from the inside. That it looks, you know, it looks wonderfully structured and regulated and there's sort of you know what you have to do to succeed at everything. Oh, no, I think that's actually totally true. I mean, I, whether it's enjoyable or not is a separate issue, but I, 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 won't, I won't deny that. I think one of the appeals in, for my own career, I mean, I, did, you know, I went to grad school straight from undergrad, and for me, one of the, you know, the appeals of going to the PhD and then going to the academy was, this is a world I know. Uh, and, you know, it's a world where, okay, I'm supposed to publish a lot. Now, I love to do that, so, you know, it, it, it's win-win. Um, but I won't lie that I think one of the reasons why I'd always, you know, I'd always considered maybe should I do the policy track instead, and there were a variety of reasons why I didn't, but I, I think one of them was, whoa, that looks a lot more uncertain. You don't know where, you know, how do you move from, you know, job A to job B and so forth. Um, and so that's, in some ways it does require a little more risk and there's potentially more downside. Now, what the, the thing that has changed, although this was true even when I got the PhD, but I, you cannot stress enough now is, that all sounds great in theory once you get the academic job. In fact, the cliff 
or the chasm between getting the PhD and actually getting a good academic job has become so vast now uh, that you know I actively discourage people from getting PhDs unless I think they've got the chops to actually get an academic position or unless they know full well going in no I want the PhD I'm interested in this in a scholarly way but then I want to go you know work for the UN or, or go, you know do something else like that then you know, so long as they're going in with their eyes open uh, I have no problem well, with that. I vividly actually remember when I figured this out which was the summer I interned at the State Department um, so this is another uh, argument for going out and trying out the kinds of things you think you want to end up doing first and I watched and I thought oh this yeah. seems really great every three years you apply for a new job and they have to give you one how wonderful you, you never get scared and then I watched <laughs> oh my goodness, this is just as political as any regular job process and you have to do it every three years and it's totally oh, out yeah. of your control. Ooh, that looks horrible. Um, and so I went from thinking yeah. it would be better than the regular job market to actually concluding it might be worse than the regular job market. So, you know, there's... Um, use this your was, 20s to try this was things my, out. Yes. No, this was my experience at Treasury as well. I really greatly enjoyed my experience when I was working at the Treasury Department. But I also came away with it convinced that one of the reasons why I really enjoyed my experience with the Treasury Department was that I knew that I could probably annoy people or piss people off in bureaucratic warfare, and it was fine because I was walking away from this at the end of the year. Um, if I knew that I'd had to deal with these people for a decade or longer, uh, I would have been much more circumscribed and probably drank a lot. And that is wonderfully full circle back to who should be Secretary of State. So um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe on that note, we... Um, we promise to come back. Um, actually, the, we may come back in January and have the same conversation all over again. I, I deeply fear. Uh, I, and I, but I would look forward to it. It's and been a long time. Have a great holiday, all of you. <laughs> in the meantime. That's true. Happy Hanukkah. Uh, happy holidays, and uh, a, you know, and hopefully this will, you know, uh, we will all survive oh the Mayan gosh, that's apocalypse. Right, the Mayan apocalypse. I'm giving you something to look forward to. Thank <laughs> <Yes>. you. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Okay. All right.